Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Beyond Deadlines podcast, where we tackle challenges that planning and schedule leaders come across on a day-to-day basis. My name is Micah Pipo, and I'm a planning and scheduling manager for Intel. And I'm Greg Lawton. I'm the CEO of an AI scheduling company called Nods and Links. Each podcast is designed to give you strategies and tactics that you can implement right away. Today, Greg's on the hot seat, but we're going to mix it up a little bit. We're going to share the hot seat, a little hot potato back and forth. (laughs) Today, you're creating the world's greatest planning and scheduling team ever assembled. How do you do it? Define greatness. Personality, revenue, acceleration, predictability. What am I doing? The best gifts and emojis ever produced. (laughs) So I'm going to take a bunch of 14-year-olds. The ability to deliver projects on time and early. Okay, so are we talking about full cycle from bid through to execution? Are we talking execution all the way through? Or are we talking a specific consultancy that that specializes in specific areas of scheduling? Let's put this on the owner or client side and have it be full cycle, but as much as an owner would be involved full cycle through that portion, if that makes sense. Yeah, and and, uh, let's say that this is a... This is a medium weight owner, so they are employing a PMO and a controls in a controls team, but they're not one to one matching the gen, the GC. Shall we say that? Yeah. Okay. They wouldn't be the right. greatest ever if they were doing that. <laughs> okay. Right. What would what would what would I have in the greatest ever? Okay. Number one is about tr- it's actually nothing to do with skill. It's about traits. So the best teams I've ever worked in, and actually how I hire my teams now. Number one, just pure intelligence, both EQ, IQ, and applied intelligence. And I'd probably say that makes 60% of my ranking criteria in hiring. Then I would do um, the the beliefs, morals, mental standing, and coachability of the individuals would be another 30%. So what I mean by this is, are they are they dedicated? have they done high potential sport or, or have evidence of extreme achievement? Um, have they got evidence of not quitting and working all the way until they hit a result, which is required dedication or pain or some kind of trial or tribulation. I really like sports people for this. And then the final bit would be, would be skill in terms of the skill spectrum. I'd want, some people who've been beaten for decades in so you know the wily people who know the ins and outs of all the tricks that are going to be played i'd want some people who know the really deeply the thing we're building so they understand the sequence and the strategy and the activity and i'd actually want a bunch of people who know nothing about being a client uh, in this domain, um, or the thing about we're building, but are pure physicists and mathematicians. I'd want people who can just pure run numbers and not look at the world in the project's eyes. And this is just for me because I've worked with a lot of data scientists. And for example, going to a data science and saying, um, I think that the thing driving the predictability of delivery is the uncertainty of task durations, they'd be able to tell you yes or no or call bullshit within about 30 minutes. Now, they wouldn't know what that meant for the projects, but it doesn't matter. They can isolate it down. And then I'd probably have over the top of it, I would have a mentoring team. So I would have some of the top construction management lecturers who come in and mentor that team. And I would have some of the SVPs from other industries also meant to that team. So you've got you've got the different ways of learning, you've got the cross contamination of the different experiences of the team, but all with the same culture of high performance. You've got um, the uh, the management, for example, myself or whoever's in charge, that is going to be setting the process systems and tools and the frameworks of thinking. And then you've got external help coming in at the side which will help them think. And I would, I would mandate that everyone has team and single mentoring sessions with those people. Not to come full circle. Why, do, why would I think 
that would be the the greatest scheduling team possible in this regard. Well, I've had to design there a team that can adapt itself because you haven't told me, told me a singular KPI. If you are if you were going, look, all we care about is predictability or all we care about is winning this claim in court, then I'd have said something different. But what you've said is the greatest client team possible who can deal with delivering complex stuff for a, and managing contractors. That's a great setup. And so let me repeat it back and see if I can get the team right. Mm -hmm. So you get people who have high EQ, IQ, and you mentioned one other one. EQ. EQ, oh, so IQ. So applied intelligence. So IQ, applied intelligence. EQ, and applied intelligence. And for me, by the way, for the listeners, applied intelligence is the ability to take frameworks and ways of thinking from one context and apply them to another context in which their application is not obvious. That's the, like a lot of humans struggle with the ability to apply learning, you know, a simple example in thinking fast and slow by Daniel Kahneman is that even stats professors fail to answer stats questions when they're not asked in a stats questions way. So that's what I mean by applied intelligence. No, that's, that's really good. I guess where I would go with this is then how would you shape this team as a move forward in the future? So you have your structure, high IQ, you know, let's say you got your all-star team, you got your, uh, your schedulers, your mentor group, your data science team, then how does that team go out and actually deliver against those goals? Because you can create, you see it in the NBA all the time, the best all-star team and it falls apart mm -hmm. because they're not gelling together and executing well. So then how do you take this excellent all-star team and make them go deliver? Beautiful question. Um, lexicon, expectations, KPIs, and processes in, in actually that order. And this is my personal preference. So lexicon, whenever I get a team or form a team, the first session I ever have with the team is shared language. Like when I say a word, what exactly does that word mean? And when I say a framework, what exactly am I meaning? So for example, when I say, can you please go and show Micah how to do this? What I mean by that is there's a, there's a four-step framework of teach, show, observe, feedback. I expect you to be able to communicate in those four words to show me how far through that cycle you've got at any one point in time and whether or not there's bottlenecks. And if someone fails at a challenge, I want to know, the reasons for that failure of skill, will, environment, and equipment. So I want to know what we're doing and how we're isolating it. So having all of these frameworks and, and lexicon in place um, is absolutely number one. And I'll give you an example. Find me a professional sports team that doesn't have precise language to communicate what they're telling each other. Strangely, we don't do that in the business world on general. It's rubbish. We should. Then we come on to um, expectations and KPIs. So this is about being incredibly clear about what behavior is expected and what is not expected and having an open conversation about this so that the scenarios can be played. So, for example, with me, it is OK. It is OK to turn up late for a meeting if there are valid reasons to do so. But it cannot be a chain. And if you turn up to a meeting late, but you weren't required anyway, the blame is on you for not rejecting the meeting. And if I personally see too many of that in my teams, I will have a word and say this is low performance behavior. I expect you to manage your time better. Now, in this lexicon, expressing what you regard as low performance is not saying the person is low performance. They're two separate things. Being able to identify behavior or work output or work processes that are not optimal is the very definition of a high performance team. And actually, I would regard behavior of a high performance individual as someone who doesn't get emotional at any of that feedback. There's someone who actually goes, thank you for pointing that out. 
I'll have a look at it and see what I can do. And then you get into the, the processes and I'll skim the KPIs, but you know, it's like, that's very easy. That's just saying exactly like, let's measure, let's do the OKRs properly, et cetera. But the processes is about what is an explicit process? What is an implicit process? What is a recurring process? And what is an emergent process? And actually having that in our lexicon detailed to each other. So there should be very, very few explicit recurrent processes. For example, there will be some which are things like monthly reporting, etc. But we should have documentation on implicit processes or non-recurring processes, which are more principle-based in nature. And we define when the, uh, the task comes about. It is much more efficient and high performance to develop processes and procedures um, at the moment of necessity than to spend ages before thinking about hypotheticals in this sense. Of course, there's somewhere you don't do that, which are health and safety. We're not playing yeah. health and safety. We're playing acceleration, predictability, risk management, et cetera. So we should just know how to do that. Yeah. A just-in-time process capture usually works the best. Yes. Because, and, and to gel it, so to get everyone together and say, I need to do this task. This is my objective. This is how I'm going to measure success. This is the time period I've got. This is my workload availability, my cycle times, et cetera. This is what I'm thinking of doing in terms of principle and steps comments and the comment is have i explained my motivation can you break my process yeah yeah i really like your approach and it's interesting because i would take a slightly different one where it seems to me you're going to take your people and apply them to a strategy or a playbook if you will and for me i would actually start with the strategy or playbook but keep it open enough that I could fit in roughly your set of people that you would pick. What it'd be my that is I would start by forming a pre-construction team and then I would form a construction, uh, construction team. And then I would form probably some sort of product R and D, you know, they're building the schedules that are the future, future plans. Then I would layer on some sort of data science analytics team. And then by having that structure, I could define a little bit better what each of these sub teams do and mm -hmm. go hire appropriately for those teams. That's how I would create the, the, the greatest scheduling team ever. Similar to your approach, I would just, I think, start with a framework for me. So that way I could chunk it out and nail it as I go along. And I may miss out on talent that way. Like with your approach, I'm saying that you could go find, oh, the best data scientist in the world. But I'm like, I haven't got to that point where I need one yet. And I might miss out on that person. <clears throat> I think that's where probably my mm. approach would differ slightly, where I would lay out a framework first. And that way I could define the goal, the mission, the objective, and then be able to go find people to fill those gaps. So my my. My comment back on that would actually depend on the the speed of scale the organization requires, because my thinking, if you may, you've made me realize this, my thinking is based on incremental mitosis. So basically, get the skeleton of what would be a perfect organization. It's just that an organization is reflected in individual people. Yeah. So you've got the ex, you've got the uh, the historic expert you've got the data center expert or whatever and you've got the data scientist so you've got like a, a trio or whatever of, of perfect and then essentially if you wanted to build a second team from that what i'd actually do is double the size of that team and give them twice as much work and then if i wanted to triple that i would then split that team into two I'd backfill in one, so at least you've got 50% experience and culture that you've set in Lexicon, and I'd grow it in mitosis that way, which would end up at, I've got my data science organization, I've got this, I've got that. that that's just my personal preference, by the way. I've, I've, my experience is that it's much less risky to get the culture set very, very small and then mitosis the teams out than it is to create divisions and then yeah. try and set the same culture between different or divisions. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, it, if I created my pre-construction team first 
and then I made that new hire into the construction team, if I'm not taking that pre-construction person and putting them in construction, I basically just created a new culture and environment. But if I went out the gates right off the bat, hired the three to four that I needed, and then as it grew, I just duplicated their roles, and then they could grow within them, I think you're going to end up it's a great point. I mean, you're just going to end up being able to scale that organization quicker. The the final thing I'd mention as well is how do you build the greatest scheduling team as well? And the other side is you are you are ruthless in tearing it down. So um, yeah, if if someone joins the organization, you have to have a one week, two week, thirty day. 60 day, 90 day, six month plan with deliverables and assessments and everything. And you need to know as quickly as possible, can this person add to the team, not just keep up, add and grow and push beyond. And and generally I found that you know that within two weeks because people are just like, this person is incredible. Like just the way they think and how fast they, like the questions they're asking, etc. And if people don't match that, you have to remove them as fast as possible because it will just disrupt the flow of all the others and it will start to questions about, well, why am I pushing so hard and you know trying to be the pin- pinnacle of my element of the profession if you know that person over there doesn't need to. But on the other side of that, if you're pushing a team this hard, um, you also have to reward in a different way. So you have to have, for example, I'd be doing plus 20% above any salary that's in the industry, and then an additional bonus based on KPIs being here of maybe another 30%. So this is the place where the best schedulers go to earn the most amount of money and to be with the other people who want to be the absolute 0.1%. And if you if you can't make it, that's okay. And I would actually imagine that people come out of that team and then try again and come back into this team, et cetera. Because what you're doing essentially is making an Olympics team. The Olympics team, all gold medals, all yeah. gold medals. Oh. The, only thing I, I, this stuff. <laughs> the only thing I'd add to that last piece is I always feel that onboarding is a two-way street where if you're hiring someone and bringing them on board, it'll show you how unprepared you are for that role and how much you need to develop to help someone get up to be successful and drink out of that fire hose as fast as possible. And what I've seen across my career is most onboarding processes are just not great. They're not built for the person who's coming in and doing the role. They're not built to get somebody up to speed quick. There's some general corporate stuff, and then it, and then it's go figure it out yourself. And that's one thing that people can really improve. And if you're starting at a place and you're new, that is a perfect place to show impact and value. Update the onboarding process. Easy way. No one ever wants to do it. No one wants to touch it. Go through your process mm-hmm. as you start to work and update the onboarding process. Well, folks, we like to keep it short here at Beyond Deadlines so you can get back on your daily grind. Greg, any final, final thoughts? Keep it short and sweet. I think my final thought would be, be very, very careful if you want to be called a high performance team, because to be honest, it's fine not to be, because everything that I've just described is a sacrifice. So what I'd say is define the kind of performance you want to be, and then you gear yourself to that. The the top 0.1% are the top 0.1% because they're they're willing to sacrifice other things in their life to be the top points. Ooh, that's a juicy place to leave it on. Well, folks, thanks for listening today. Remember, please share the podcast, like, subscribe it, and we will see you next week.